This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. My guest today is Seth Kaplan. And we're going to talk about his book, Fragile Neighborhoods. Before we get to the episode, thank you again for all of those who've written reviews of the podcast. I appreciate it. It really helps grow the podcast. If you like the podcast and you have not yet written a review, please go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. And please share with your friends. Uh, thank you to those of you who've supported me on Patreon. That does really help me keep doing the podcast, so I appreciate it. Like every episode, the show notes for this episode and links to resources and books we discuss can be found at themoralimagination.com. And then you can subscribe there for my occasional newsletter when I send out updates about the podcast or essays I've written or other projects I'm working on. Uh, so I appreciate that. So let's get to the podcast. My guest today is Seth Kaplan. He is a leading expert on fragile states. He's a prof professorial lecturer at the Paul H. Nitt School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. He's a senior advisor for the Institute for Integrated Transitions and consultant to multilateral organizations such as the World Bank, the U.S. State Department, U.S. Agency for International Development, OECD, as well as developing country governments and NGOs. Um, we're going to talk today not about fragile states uh, very much, but we're going to talk about his new book, called Fragile Neighborhoods, Repairing American Society, One Zip Code at a Time. Uh, so I'm very uh, happy to have Seth on the podcast. Thanks so much for taking time to talk with me. My pleasure to be here with you, Michael. So let's maybe uh, begin with the big picture and the idea of your book, which I know you've talked about a lot. You're, you're an expert. Your training and your work, your career has been working in fragile states. So you're in places like Afghanistan or Nigeria or Sri Lanka during a war. And you tell the story of how this experience kind of started to point you to thinking about the United States. Can you talk about maybe just a little bit about your background and how you got to write this book, Fragile Neighborhoods, and then, or, or maybe even start, what is Fragile Neighborhoods about and then how you got there? Maybe I'll first start where I came from, if it's okay with you. It's, it's a little more logical. So I have, for the last mostly 20 years, been working on fragile states, fragile societies. Basically, those are countries that are chronically uh, politically unstable, prone to violence, war, coups, instability, typically very poor, underdeveloped countries. About one-third of the world's countries are fragile. Uh, I've worked on roughly 35 countries, been in about 75 countries. One very big and central takeaway of all of this work from my side is that relationships are key to understanding. The nature of relationships are key to understanding how well a country is doing. Relationships are central to the health of any society, and society is upstream from politics and economics. So if you write about politics, you write about economics, start thinking about how important institutions are. Everybody says institutions matter in my business. But for me, before institutions, it's the nature of relationships. Relationships make institutions, make politics and economics. Take that as a starting point. And I had developed a pretty good reputation as the fragile states guy, the guy to go to in Washington, D.C., and then 2015, 2016 comes, and you know what happens in our politics, and a lot of people get anxious, especially in Washington, and just out of the blue, without any prompting, over and over again, I kept being asked, is America becoming a fragile state? Now, as someone who had just come back from Sri Lanka, Africa, Middle East, this question didn't quite make sense. Our institutions may not be perfect, but they've been around for hundreds of years. We have a very strong uh, civil society and we have great technology, dynamic businesses. We're materially very wealthy compared to most places. But if people keep asking me, there's something there. So I started on this journey. For me, anytime I want to go study a country, it's a little bit like a journey. My life, you could consider as a series of journeys. So I went basically visit lots of places. I spoke to uh, lots of people. And of course, I read and read and read. And for me, what I, again, this idea that relationships matter 
And therefore, I was looking, I think the real question you have to ask about the United States, we have many things going very well in our country, but something has gotten worse in the last couple of generations, the politics, the trust, the social breakdown, the deaths of despair, the health crisis, the depression, and so the rise of suicides. The big question that we have to ask ourselves is what has changed in our relationships that lead us to have so many social and political problems? That is the question that really grounded my work, centered my work. And a lot of people, they worry about the national and the national results or the national data matters. But for me, I was looking for what had changed. And I think what's changed most dramatically is the nature of relationships at a very interpersonal local level. And so that is what I centered my work. I looked at that issue and that led me to focus on neighborhoods. And I just will put out one statistic. I mean, America is a big country, a lot of diversity, every place. We just spoke before, Michael, about how your neighborhood is so different than my neighborhood. And we could talk about even in a city, how different neighborhoods are. But one statistic is that there's a 40 year gap in average lifespan, depending upon what neighborhood you live in, in America. And even if that wasn't, so that that could be a few miles apart, but even more typical might be 20, 25 years. If there's such an enormous difference in how people are experiencing life, then something at the neighborhood level really varies tremendously, affects people tremendously, matters tremendously, And for me, it's shaping everything else. So this is where I decided, and there's plenty of data to support this, that neighborhoods is the unit that we should examine how people are experiencing the country and look into it. And that became the focus. How have relationships changed at the neighbor level and what can we do about it? That's the central theme of my book. Okay, that's great. No, it's a very uh, wonderful explanation. And so I have a lot of questions, as you know. Let's maybe just begin a little bit. Could you drill down a bit more into what would be some examples of relationship shifts and what do neighborhoods with healthy relationships look like? And then what do neighborhoods where the life expectancy has dropped 20, 25, 40 years, what do the relationships look like there? So what's the key difference? And that is is what makes it fragile. So what are the relationships that make something fragile versus robust? Again, relationships depend upon the nature of norms, the nature of institutions, and the difference in a healthy or strong neighborhood versus a fragile one. You can put all neighborhoods on a continuum. I don't think you could exactly plot them because we don't have, we don't, again, it, it, there's great variation, but broadly speaking, this is continuum. A fragile neighborhood will have weak supporting institutions, a lot of mistrust. Family stability might be an issue. Interfamily dynamics might be an issue. There might be very few institutions like social institutions of any type that lifts you up. There might be even a lack of for- government might be distant. Access to things might be distant. And generally, it's stressful. It's uh, a lot of uh, negative interactions and a, a, a robust dynamic neighborhood is the opposite. And let me just give some practical examples. Mm-hmm. I can recall many times, almost on a weekly basis, where m- my neighborhood mattered to my well being. And I honestly, when I walk down the streets in my neighborhood, I have a sense of joy. Joy, not because I'm friends with everybody, joy because I know the pe- I have all these relationships, I know who's behind the door of these houses. I know basically how many kids they have, where their kids go to school, something about the people. I know if I have a need, I can knock on the door. I know I'm going to see these people in whatever, a restaurant, uh, some local institution, wherever it is, there's all this interaction, activity, lots of stuff going on. And just to give it again, an example, I can recall some years ago, my daughter, probably about seven, eight years old at the time, we had just come out of my car right in front of this house here. And she dropped her younger brother about a year and a half on the cement and his, his basically his chin is bleeding. And you can just feel me as a parent, even now 
just the anguish, just remembering that incident. My wife, who's like Mrs. can deal with any emergency, so that's like her nature. She picks him up without even thinking and runs down the street. I can just visualize her getting the kid, taking off down the street, not even talking to us. We have no idea where she goes. Comes back in about 40 minutes, he's all bandaged up. She went to the nearest nurse. She knew exactly where the nearest nurse is. And as it turns out, over the years, we probably have eight to 10 nurses, doctors within walking distance of where we live. And she more than I, but I know many of them. We know these people. Again, I don't think any of them are friends, but we have a relationship. And there's this mindset of people in my neighborhood that we care enough about each other. We have a common destiny. We're here to help each other, whatever the incident might be. And imagine that that example I gave multiplied. And so, so just imagine the, the person who's having trouble maybe paying their mortgage or the person who had some lost a job and needed to find help or the teenager who wanted some mentoring on what they should be doing in their life. Or imagine just hundreds of these little interactions or needs that people have. My wife went away some weeks ago for her mother. To, she wasn't feeling well. I needed help with carpool. Just imagine all of these things. You live in a social, secu- a, a society, it's what I mean by social, social security, like net web security blanket that's just there for you. It changes your feeling, changes your mindset. And it really, it lifts you when you have a need to be lifted and it provides access to opportunity when you have a need for that. And I think most people lived in some form of that two generations ago, and then most people today do not. And that is a dramatic change. And that's why people are vulnerable, at risk, and they're forced basically to go to government. And government can help with some things, but it certainly can't help with most of the things I've described, and neither can your phone. Yeah. Okay, good. We'll talk about your phone in a minute. Um, so like one of the things I'll, I'll sometimes, this is a, as a big picture description. So I directed a film years ago called Poverty Inc., which is a kind of a critique of global humanitarianism and just talking about the, the need for institutions of justice. And so one of the things I'll say is like, w- when we look at poverty in the developing world, and this is not necessarily like the most fragile states, but poverty in the developing world broadly, you see that the Poor people aren't poor simply because they lack stuff. Poor people are poor because they lack access to the institutions of justice that we often take for granted, like clear title to land, ability to register your business in the formal economy, ability to get your court case heard, all these kinds of things that like we can just kind of get done more or less. And this is the fragile state versus non-fragile state point as well. But in the United States and perhaps in parts of Europe as well, the poverty is not so much that you don't have that access, not that not that it's the same, but that you lack access to what could be called social capital, right? Like whether it's the kind of things you just described, right? So for example, oh, I I, I got hurt. I, there's a doctor I know, or I know a lawyer. I have a question about law. I have a question about all the little things you, you, you gave examples to. And that there's both bonding social capital problems and also uh, what a sociologist called bridging social capital. So that is um, a bridge for me to get say an opportunity, a new job, a new, a new connections or information. And it seems that one of the big problems that, that people have, poor people especially have today, is they lack this social capital, bonding and bridging. And even if they have bonding, it may not always necessarily be the healthiest. Um, what do you think about that articulation? And then you've done a lot of work on this. Could you maybe go into that a little bit more detail? I would probably not differentiate as much between the two types that you referred to, the a developing country versus a wealthy country, because I think they both have aspects of both of those problems you mentioned. Mm-hmm, that's right. Uh, again, again, if you live in a country that's politically unstable and there's conflict and there's war and there's really bad government, there is a great limit to what you yourself can do to rise up. Besides, that's why people immigrate. A lot of people migrate. They leave the country because they don't that the, everything that they could be doing is right, and yet the place itself limits you. And so the, let's put that aside. What you referred to, the developing country, the problem of property title and finance and all that stuff, sounds very much like Hernando de Soto, a very famous uh, economist from Peru. 
Um, I believe he ran the Institute for Liberty and Democracy or something like that. And um, I think if you go to some poor parts of America, you have some aspect of that. You have a difficulty in accessing finance. I'm just thinking of someone I work in, I know who works in a neighborhood in South Dallas. Mm -hmm. And basically it's it's like not a huge neighborhood, 5,500 people, very poor, lots of challenges within the neighborhood, but there's also the challenges that anything you want from government to healthcare, to finance, to even a good restaurant does not exist in the neighborhood. So right. something about the physical place and the people's access to different things, it's limiting. And then when you talk about bonding and bridging, I mean, I, I certainly have researched and write a lot about that. I, I would say that both bonding and bridging tend to hold back people. When I write and when I talk about this, the problem of relationship poverty or social poverty, I am differentiating between economic and social. And I also want to argue that you can be materially well off, socially poor, and you can be materially poor and socially well off. And I think when you talk about bonding and bridging, explain some of that. If you are materially well off, again, you can use money to solve many of your problems and you likely have some access to some bridging network that helps you get ahead, but you may not have many close relationships. You may be very lonely, isolated, and feel very vulnerable despite your material well-being. On the other hand, I could think of the worst neighborhoods in the, in like the very distressed neighborhoods in the United States in which 30% or more people are poor and there's generally a downward trajectory. These places don't only lack money, but they lack both kinds of, and the bonding isn't there, there's no trust, and family stability would be part of that. Interfamily relationships, associational life is all lacking, and they lack access to the right types of networks to get ahead and It's important that if we are trying to help these people, yes, training may matter and other things may matter and some material things may matter, but we have to address both of those for people to thrive. You could do one without the other and you will have some impact, but a really big impact happens when you can do both. Yeah. So that actually leads me to two two questions. I want to talk to you about the difference between like networks and relationships. But in your first chapter, after the introduction, your first chapter is called Two Faces of Poverty in America. And you begin with a quote from Mother Teresa. You quote her. She says, we think sometimes that poverty is only being hungry, naked, and homeless. The poverty of being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for is the greatest poverty. We must start in our own homes to remedy this kind of poverty. I think that's related to what you just said. There are two faces of poverty. There's two kinds of poverty. Could you, you've already talked about it a little bit, but could you go into the difference between like social poverty versus economic poverty? Because one of the things it seems you're focused on is social poverty as the primary difficulty that we have. Not that material poverty doesn't matter. You're not saying that, but that the real problem is this relationship poverty. Could you talk about that and explain the two faces of poverty? And I think the reason I, I want you to also go into the point of, you know, we tend to think in the United States, we, I think this is a Western problem. We tend to think of everything in kind of utilitarian or commercial way, uh, ways. And so there can be an easy way to think, oh, poverty equals simply material poverty. But I think it's also Mother Teresa who said something like one of the poorest places she's ever been is the United States, seeing the poverty relationships. So could you talk about how to think about that, this tension between those two things? Yes, I, I have lots of immigrant friends who came to America and they are grateful for many of the benefits about the United States of living here. But certainly one of the things that they uh, wish was better was the social relationships and dynamics. And they feel a certain amount of social poverty, even if the life is safer, opportunities greater, their material well-being is more. Uh, so I, I do think it's a, it's a widespread observation. So I think we can think about this in, in multiple ways. Think of a, a relatively, th- think of like, since I used the example of immigrants, you can find immigrant communities who come here 
they're very poor. They come with very little, but they have very strong social cohesion. And they are working together on a daily basis to help each other. And it was a really famous study, which I um, many people know, um, about the 1995 heat wave that hit Chicago. It was an exceptionally hot time for several days. And Eric Klinenberg did a study comparing neighborhoods and tried to, like a social autopsy. Why did some neighborhoods have many more dead people uh, than other neighborhoods? And he draws this stark contrast between two neighborhoods that were equally poor. One was actually an immigrant community uh, or more an immigrant community than the other. And even though equally poor, one had very few deaths and one had a lot of deaths. And the big difference was before the crisis, just think COVID is is a crisis, the heat wave was a crisis, the strength of your social bonds, your connectivity prepares a place, a neighborhood, a community for the challenge that that crisis will bring. So before that heat wave hit, that neighborhood that did very well, had very few deaths, they had more small businesses, they had stronger interpersonal relationships, they had stronger norms. There was all these things going on that made people connected to each other. You might say the neighborhood glue was stronger and therefore they took care of each other. The other neighborhood was more isolating, less connectivity, less lots of things that brought people together, and therefore a lot more people died simply because nobody took care of each other. And so that is a clear example where it's not the material that matters, it's the social. The similar studies about the tsunami in Japan. It's like a natural experiment all those towns on the coast, why did similar towns that were affected in similar ways by the wave have such different results? Because the towns that had good cohesion before, people went back and brought the more vulnerable out. And those where there was low trust and low support, they had many more deaths because people simply uh, did not have the same norm of care. So, I, and I think on the other hand, you can go to materially well-off places. Some of them are socially thriving. You go to some places where no one talks to each other, nobody knows with each other, and there is more depression, more mental illness, more alienated kids, and uh, it, th- that your money cannot make you feel good, feel happy, and uh, we have to ask. What, what is it that we not only have to tackle the material poverty, but we certainly need a strategy. And I don't always mean, I don't really mean government, but we have to think hard about how do you design a society that strengthens connectivity, strengthens community, such that everyone will be able to thrive. No, that's very helpful. Um, one of the things you, you make this distinction is between, uh, how do you say it, between networks versus community. Um, and that America has shifted in many ways from a community-based society to a network society. And that benefits some people. Some people can really flourish. Now, as you point out, some people who flourish in networks are still lonely and unhappy, okay? But other people are really left behind because they're more communal versus network. Could you walk through that? And, you know, we've talked about the work of Chris Arnotti, and Chris has been on the podcast uh, before in his book, uh, he wrote about talking his book, Dignity. And he makes a difference between front, what he called front row and back row America. And he, he talks about that this community element is, is also really important. Could you go through the network versus community distinction? Because I think it's a very helpful one. Great book, great author. So uh, good, always happy to be in the conversation with Chris Arnett. Uh, but I would say the key thing to understand is historically, it's not only America, historically, people lived in place-based communities. They shopped locally. They prayed locally. Kids went to school locally. We didn't have cars. We might have had other transport from the 19th century. There was public transport and things like that. But for the most part, people lived in physically bounded places that were distinct. And that organically created us uh, relationships organically created um, a sense of common destiny, organically 
led people to have a sense of purpose that they could contribute, add value. I mean, this wasn't true everywhere. And there were many problems with that world. For example, discrimination. I mean, blacks were redlined into certain neighborhoods. But that was the design of society organically without much thought. It was even reflected in urban planning. You go to older cities in many, many parts of the world, just think Italy, and the whole landscape is designed around neighborhoods, neighborhood church, neighborhood public square, everything. And then post-World War II, we planned for a different development model. That's urban planning. But also things become nationalized or regionalized. Government becomes more centralized. Uh, Social institutions become professionalized into nonprofits that are more distant. And the car, of course, and technology changes everything about how we live. And the result is that we become, we also open up a lot of constraints on people, whether it's race, gender, other things. And the result is a much more dynamic, in some ways, a fairer society, a more dynamic a society. The economy benefits, lots of people, individuals benefit, but there's a downside to that that is not well appreciated. The downside is several. This network society gives great advantage to people who are in the right networks. Some of them are from specific places that are doing well. Some of them are because you got into the right school, you got into the right job, and that network carries you upward. But for every network that people join, there's a whole bunch of other people. They live in a place where there are no good networks. Uh, They are personally, I can think of myself, for example, not great networking. If there's a there's some event with 100 people. I'm the one in the corner pretending I'm busy. So I'm not a great networker. One-on-one coffee, great, but don't ask me to go like systematically network as some people do. So people may not be good at it. Places may not be very have very good networks. And just some people, even if they try their best, may never get into the right networks. They may not have the right way of talking, which some authors have that way of talking. They may not know how to apply There's a lot of reasons why, and if you're in a good network, it it helps you and your children stay in that network. So there's all, there's a different type of inequality or unfairness that's not based upon how smart you are or how hard you work. It's based upon what network you're in. I don't just say one more thing. When you're in a place-based, a society built around place-based institutions, not everything is great. Not every place has those great institutions, But for the most part, every place has some social structures that are there to support you on a daily basis. When you're in a network society, you end up with a lot of places in which there may not be social structures to support you. And a lot of people may just be lonely, alienated. And and you you often have no influence, no ability to influence to make anything better, which is also an alienating it explains much of our mistrust and alienation that people, so many people are out of the system, so to speak. This has affected men, women, and children. We see, for example, family breakdown. I mean, fatherhood statistics show that the absence of a father in the house uh, leads to four times greater risk in poverty, uh, infant more, higher infant mortality, more likely to go to prison, to prison more likely to face abuse, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. There's, this, there's a, a clear family breakdown. This is very harmful for children. It's very harmful for women. And also men suffer, right? And so I'm part of the deaths of despair argument of people like uh, Angus Deaton and, and Anne Case, but in, in a, another, a number of writers talking about this, um, Nicholas Eberstadt talking about men without work. You could talk about all those demographics, but uh, maybe we'll start with, with men. Um, some men are really good networkers, but a lot of men really flourish in place-based communities where they have a purpose and men feel a lack of purpose. And these are, I mean, obviously, Seth, this is like a super complex question, but there's a lot of things going on. But could you talk about it from your perspective? How is this specifically affecting men? And then let's talk about women, children, and families in general. Okay. I, I think uh, there's two strands here. One is, I think that the movement from place-based institutions to networks has 
led to what we might call a great disinstitutionalization of social life. And that affects people's desire to be married. That affects the strength of marriages. That affects the attachment to, to jobs. And it affects a lot of things. And and again, there's a dying meaning, really too. Like there's like purpose. And that's a different level, but yes, but, but uh, uh, yeah. So purpose, meaning all of that. And again, there's a dynamism that this shift has produced, which we don't want to ignore the positive aspects and those that benefit. But for sure, the deinstitutionalization of social life, I think, is one of the underappreciated challenges that we as a society face. I mean, you could even argue the decline in people wanting to get, as I mentioned, decline in willingness to get married, decline in desire to have children. Lots of things is simply because we have become so trained and so acclimated, or I would even use the word socialized, to spend time alone and spend time virtually and spend time in a certain way. We have undone the the natural socialization that humans have basically been experiencing for all of human history in in certain ways. I mean, you're not going to completely undo it, but some of it is being undone. So I think that that in itself is a whole challenge. I mean, men, it's hard for me to say this happens and it's directly contributing to the to the malaise of men in our society. But I totally agree with your assertion that women are simply I mean, I see it every day with women all around me. Women do well in networks. Men do well in structures. And the fact that we've moved from a society of structures to a society of networks, I do believe explain one of the reasons that women are in so many ways. I mean, there's certainly some areas men do better than men, men do better than women. But on average, it does seem quite significantly that women are doing better than men. And I think one of the underexplored areas is this move from place-based structures to networks. And I mean, it's most obvious because when men are not married or when families are not married, you see that the the boys turn out much worse than the girls, but even the men adults turn out less well than the women adults. And you can just see this over and over and over again, but I, I don't think it's only marriage. I think it's harder to prove at a neighborhood or a place level, but I believe this lack of having some feeling of agency, some feeling not only of belonging, but ownership in something that you can rise up and play a leadership role. I think this explains a lot about the lack of motivation and the, the basically the despair that so many men feel in America. So I think you're spot on. And I the only way for me to reverse that is making neighborhoods matter, neighborhood institutions matter, and ensuring that every every man and woman have great opportunities to contribute and play a role in their local areas. Yeah, that's good. So there's a lot of things that you talk about that are very practical, and I want to get there. Let's actually move here from your big picture into some theoretical questions that I think are important and we've started to touch on, um, and, and practical ones, I guess, as well. So Alexis de Tocqueville, the great Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, worried that one of the problems in democratic life was going to be what he called individualism. And that is a turning into self, right? He describes that. It's not just typical egoism, but it's a turning into self. And there's a couple things going on here that um, he worried that individualism would lead to centralization, right? Because we would just kind of turn ourselves and give everything to the government. And that centralization would actually lead to increased individualism. Yes. And so there's this uh, tension going on there. And then I think if you add, so so I'm going to break this up into a couple parts. So if you add that, say, technology that you brought up a couple times, right? Looking into our phones, have you 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 talked about some of the work of Jean Jean Twenge and and her work on, on which we could talk about? You have a lot of forces towards individualism going on, 
And then we say, okay, well, we see political problems. So, so back to Tocqueville for listeners. I know you know this very well, Seth. But so Tocqueville then says, okay, well, how do we what how do we fight these these tendencies? He says you need local politics, civil society, and religion. And I want to talk about all three of those. This because it gets you out of yourself, and engaged with communities. And so a couple of things you've brought up, um, and this is a, I know I'm asking a lot here is one you've talked about the shift from nonprofits to becoming professionalized. So that instead of community people helping each other, it's more professional nonprofits. So that's an issue. There's the technology issue. And then there's the government issue. And I mean by that, say, for example, the Great Society, right? So the Great Society of the Johnson uh, administration, this idea that we're going to make sure there's a social safety net, that we're going to make sure that people don't fall through the cracks. What did happen intentionally or not intentionally, what happened was it oftentimes crowded out those neighborhood associational elements. And I think you, you explained this quite well. We, we began to attach services to the individual instead of to the family and the community. And so a whole host of forces from st- the state, from the economy, from technology, and then just democratic life and the desire to be individual. I had a long podcast with Carter Sneed about expressive individualism and this this. This idea. So there's philosophical source, there's a host of sources, but I know that's a big picture theory, but I know you've thought about this a lot. Could you talk maybe a little bit about the impact of government, technology, and this move of individualism and how we should think about it? I, I, you're right that the Tocqueville talked about it. I, I think many other people also talked about it, people on the left and the right. Yep. What I found, one of the insightful books when I did this research, and again, I read a lot of books, Eric Fromm discussing the rise of fascism in Europe, and he wrote this around 1943. So World War II is still raging, and he is um, asking, how did such developed countries ended up wanting such authoritarian leaders? And his argument is so similar that basically something about society had developed, that it freed the individual, but also gave the individual. So there was great, the removal of certain constraints created these benefits, but it also created downsides because there was a longing and that by diminishing these institutions, the diminishment of institutions freed people and yet they, they ended up longing for strong leader as a replacement. So it basically cr- created two contradictory trends that both were the result of the same cause. And I find and there's a certain line in there that I, I don't recall the exact wording, which is really, really good on this. So, so I think I think we have the same challenge in many ways that he refers to. Uh, can I add one thing? Can I add one thing yes. before you go? I don't, don't, don't want you to lose track. But also, and we've talked about this, uh, you know, Robert Nisbet calls it the quest for community, right? In The quest for community, yes. He writes are, at the same time period. And Durkheim earlier looking at suicide, right? 1890s, 1890s, yes. That, that you're kind of alone. And yes, so these are, yes, yes. These, these things I think are, are, are there's a, as you said, there's a lot of thought about this, but keep, keep going, please. And I'm going to find that. So so, yeah, you got to find the from quote. So there is, I mean, we're talking about from the, from industrialization, urbanization in the United States case, mass immigration, these great changes to society and how society responds to ensure that people still have a sense of community and belonging, which are essential to human well-being. We need to make it clear that without belonging and some sense of community, people will not do well. And I think that's proven over and over again in human history. Now, there was a whole wave of change in the 19th century, and society responded by building a whole slew of new, innovative, social, basically what I would call translocal organizations that had thousands. I mean, some of them had 15,000 local chapters, and then they were combined into state and national organizations the key point was that the Putnam local society, according to scholars like Thetoscopo, really was a lot of translocal. Yes, there were some independent, autonomous, spontaneous, but a lot of it was organized nationally. And so there was that, and that worked for several generations. And now we've had, so back into the causes of change. So I think we are living in an age, partly because of globalization and 
changes in the economy, partly because of the rise of technology, partly because of changes in government, and we could go on it, partly because of so much the professionalization. I mentioned deinstitutionalization of social life. There's, on the other hand, professionalization to some extent of everything in society. If it's not, a lot of things that were informal now are formal, organized, large, and involve doing to others or transactional versus doing together, which is no sense of building fraternity, building trust, cooperating. All of these things happen in parallel, which means that the countervailing or the counterbalancing forces to ensure society is strong enough to ensure that we have a healthy society become that much harder. And so I believe we've been under pressure for, for a couple of generations. And the big question, which my book attempts to do, is to at least show a way forward what would it look like if we were to innovate in terms of social life, innovate in terms of, we're not going to change how people interact, but innovate in terms of institutions, social entrepreneurs, social initiatives, social structures, organization of the physical landscape. What can we do to innovate to restore some of the key social institutions and conceivably develop new social institutions that are fit to the age that restore the sense of belonging and community across what now is a much larger country. We're 330 million people. And compared to the progressive age, we're from east to west, much, much larger. And so, so I mean, this is what I attempt to do. And I, and I think each of those factors are important. I don't want to put government as the, the main or the only culprit, I think some people do. I think technology, mm-hmm. in terms of the car, in terms yep. of what it's done to businesses, what it's, it's like better management, better technology in terms of management, in terms of the nonprofit world. Certainly the fact that government could have grown in a way that supported the local, but often has grown in a way that encouraged large nonprofits and grown in a way that was very focused on individuals and silos, I think all of that is to the negative. I think it could have acted differently with much fewer negative repercussions on society. And you could find some countries around the world with a very strong state, but that doesn't damage society in the same ways that ours has. Yeah. So I think, I mean, this is, that's it's very good. I think that you, you identify a multifaceted source, which I think is really important because sometimes we say, oh, it's government's fault or it's technology's fault, but it's actually, it's a host of things that are changing and some things for the good, some things for the bad, and there are trade-offs. You know, I also think, which I mentioned just a moment ago, I mean, there's, there's also a philosophical sense of what's called expressive individualism, right? That the law has to protect the individual at the expense of everyone else and that we can follow our passions. And, you know, so I actually, I refer to Carter Sneed's podcast, uh, which I send listeners to, and you can listen to it too, Seth. But uh, Sneed says, you know, you can be an expressive individualist all you want, uh, but you should be nowhere near the law because uh, following your own passions uh, is great if you're a healthy adult. But if you're a child or elderly, um, the only reason you're able to do that now as a healthy adult is because somebody else didn't do that to take care of you. And that our, our, I think there's legal and cultural things as well. Two other points I'd like to make is one is, um, you know, both of us actually, we found out we both lived in Japan. For quite a long time, I for five years and you for three or four, or five, four years, four years, four years. Nihongo uh, <laughs> But one of the things I remember when I was in Japan, I had this. People would always say, "Oh, well, Japan is a collective, and the United States is individual." And there was something partially true about that, but something always didn't set right with me about that because, and I, it took me a while to figure it out. But what I realized is that the United States is more than just individualist not collective. The United States was associationalist. And this is what Tocqueville says is one of the remarkable things about, about the United States. We were various, we did, let's do things, let's solve problems, let's get together. We still have that tendency. I mean, we're still very associationalist in many ways. But what, what you identify is we've dropped dramatically, and other people as well, right, where the professionalization of nonprofit, as you talk about, these mutual aid societies, like the Knights of Columbus would be an example of, you know, very like lodges and things that had individual local, you know, manifestations or, or instantiations, but had a national character, you know, life and health insurance, 
and disability insurance. I have to get the data exactly, but I was talking to somebody about who knows this quite well. And about, say, 7,500 years ago, 90 plus percent of life, health, and disability insurance was um, through these um, mutual aid societies and these kind of things, Knights of Columbus type of things, right? Uh, fraternal associations, so they are called. And now it's about 2% of life. And that sort of some benefits, right? Because you said like the professionalization of management, um, more efficient, but we also lost all the things that came with people knew each other. They went to the lodge, they saw each other weekly. So these things have all fallen apart. And then the technology aspect, I think is also important. Um, one of the things that you, you say, and we'll get to this here, is that, you know, we need to rethink how we're doing place-based and what you call a sideways approach. And this fits into the principle um, in Catholic social teaching called subsidiarity and that those people closest to the problem handle it. And I think generally in the West, we've lost um, some of the appreciation of subsidiarity, not just government, not just the market, not just the professionalization of nonprofits, but all of these things together. Um, And that, that, Part of the, what we need to do is, as I think you said, and you could, you'll, we'll talk about that, is reinvigorate like social innovation in this area. So you you say you call it a sideways approach that we have to that place matters and that we need to take a sideways approach. And then you you actually give some great examples throughout the book, which I want to. We don't have that much time, but we can talk about some of them. Could you maybe give the big picture of the sideways approach and how you think about rejuvenating communities? Okay, mostly we think of change top down or bottom up. Top down, it's government or some organization that's distant and it's basically being done to us. And I think one of the problems we have is that so many people think as opposed to them participating in some local initiative or organization where they could have an ownership stake in and have a sense of agency, people feel that things are being done to them economically, socially, politically. And so there's a lot of top down and, it, and it's happening in more ways than, than we can imagine. Bottom up is often considered the ideal and that we locally get together, we organize, we have some initiative. When I say horizontal, um, it's a bit different than bottom up. It is in society. It is at more at the bottom, but horizontal means that the place matters And I'm going to say horizontal means two things. One is a place matters, a neighborhood matters. And horizontal means that we're thinking in terms of relationships matter in a place. So we're trying to be inclusive of a place. We're thinking of the social dynamics in the place. We're building relationships across the place. Bottom up could still be very siloed. It could be focused on very few people. It could be bottom up and then it could be have nothing to do with place. For me, Horizontal sideway means relational at a place level, again, you're bonding, but it also means across. We are a huge country, so it means between places, and it also is a great reminder that a thriving country or flourishing country needs to ensure that as many of these neighborhoods that people live in and how they experience life are all thriving at the same time. And so it's thinking sideways or horizontal about what success is. And it's thinking of the bonding bridging and it's thinking about what we we should measure success, not by a vertical indicator, but by horizontal indicators. The vertical matters on some level. I don't want to downplay it, but you can have a great vertical number and have a lot of places not doing well and a lot of people not happy and angry, actually. You give a couple of examples of how to do this. And um, you talk about the sideways approach from families and communities and building trust together. Why don't we start with the family example? Um, you tell the story in your book about uh, J.P. DeGantz and his work uh, with Comunio. And you you begin, the, the chapter is chapter seven, is church saving marriage at scale. And you quote Confucius. To put the world in order, we must first put the nation in order. To put the nation in order, we must put the family in order. To put the family in order, we must first cultivate our personal life. We must set our hearts right. And you go through this, uh, some of the project of that, what J.P. DeGance is doing and the family. And, and I think, you know, if you look at family breakdown and statistics, generally speaking, and I'll put some of these statistics actually on the show notes uh, for listeners, 
But if you come from an intact family, your chance of being in poverty is like three to 5%, maybe a little bit higher. Um, whether you're white, Hispanic, African-American, generally speaking, if you come from an intact family, this is one of the most important indicators and predictors of poverty, but also a host of other social uh, successes, if you want to call that, and what, what I would call social and human flourishing, right? Beyond the economic, right? Much more beyond the economic, but really human and social flourishing, leading a good life. The family is an essential element. So let's talk about the family. You mentioned some of the problems in, in America, right? You talk about um, how Charles Murray points this cultural divide in marriage. You see it's not just uh, the African-American families, but white families are also uh, declining, uh, it's not just urban families, it's also rural families. Um, and you talk about, you, this is a quote from you, both biological parents remaining in the home is therefore arguably the most important single tool for preventing social breakdown. And despite this, we have huge numbers of children that are not being raised with their parents. Can you talk about this and then maybe talk also about some of the work of J.P. DeGantz and some of the sideways approaches to this problem? Yeah. So one of the most shocking, there's a few shocking statistics that I came across when I did research in these many years. One is the number of people dying of drug overdoses, twice as many um, in one year than 20 years of the Vietnam War. Totally shocking, never receives any attention. Unbelievable that it's not in the news every day. Uh, but the second is the way children are being raised. And I'm a big proponent that marriage matters and a big proponent that strong families matter. But what's interesting is the biggest difference between the European Union and the United States. The European Union is not quite as wealthy as the United States, but it's the easiest comparison to make because it's uh, roughly it's a bigger population, but similar scale, many countries, similar scale, uh, Western values, Western ideas. If you look at the marriage rate, the, the children growing up in married or unmarried homes, the difference between the United States and the European Union is not great. I think it's three percentage points. But if you look at the statistics for children growing up in two parent families versus one fam parent or no parents or whatever it is, the gap is if memory serves me right, something like 16%. And what you're learning, don't quote me on those exact numbers because it's not in front of me. But what's shocking is that there is a general trend in our country to be open to all types of families. And I certainly want to be open to all types of ways to support kids because having a kid and as, as a parent is the single biggest responsibility in my whole life, without a doubt. Uh, whatever else I try to do pales in the comparison to bringing a child in the world. And I just feel whatever else is there, that is a type of obligation I have to that child that nothing else matters. And if, if that means suffering a little bit more in my relationships, my family or my career or my friendships, whatever it is, it's essential. So for me, that makes sense. For a lot of people want to say that marriage is old and we shouldn't we shouldn't make it as important as I want to make it. Okay, so let's suppose I say fine, but then look at the statistics and says in Europe, especially Northern Europe, there are a lot of people who are telling you marriage doesn't matter to them, but the obligation of taking care of a kid they bring into the world does. And why is this gap between the United States? And Europe, if we were just to reach European numbers, which are, I think, 79% of kids grow up in households with two parents or something like that, we would have, I think it was 5 million more children growing up in what I would call a stable home versus an unstable home. And that is not about more marriage. That's about 5 million more kids with a much better prospect of getting ahead and having a good life than we are currently doing. And I don't think anything the government or anybody else can do would have as big as an impact. Yes, I wish they were all married, but let's put aside marriage if it's controversial for some people. Let's just talk about you have a child, you have an obligation. Why is it that in America, so few people, 
and I won't talk about male or female, feel that sense of obligation that they should stand up for what they've produced. That to me is the most shocking part. And as you mentioned, the data on everything from grades to mental illness, to chance of getting into trouble with the law, to social mobility, to poverty, to basic health, it all is an incredible difference between that stable, especially marriage, but let's just say stable two-parent family and unstable home, which is not only one, I mean, in America, one out of every 33 kids have neither parent in the home. And that's mostly not because grandparents are, pl- are there of choice. It's mostly because the parents are not there for whatever reason. So, I mean, th- this data just blows my mind. And I don't think there's anything except in a conflict zone where a lot of parents have been killed. There's not- nothing in a stable, politically stable, wealthy country anywhere in human history that has data like this. Yeah, this is a big, it's a big deal. And it's tied to a lot of, a lot of things. Um, it's tied to sexual revolution. It's tied to politics, government, technology. And again, many of those things happen in Europe. Europe has a bigger government. Europe had the sexual revolution, yet something about our norms or our sense of, it's it's simply, I just feel Americans in general have feel a much less sense of obligation to one another. We talked about some of this earlier. And the fact that it extends in certain populations to their kids is just, for me, um, very hard to swallow, to be honest. Yeah, it's a very big problem. And we could spend a lot of time on on, on that. And I, I didn't, so I, I could answer your question. So J.P. DeGan, oh, yeah, let me go to J.P. DeGan. I'll ask you about Let that. me go, I, so, sorry, I can get very emotional about that topic because I look at my kids every day and I, and I feel for other kids that don't have parents there every day for them. So um, J.P. was doing policy work he was very involved thinking he like, like a lot of people, I'm going to somehow change the world by changing the policies. And I mean, he was happily married. He uh, had a couple of kids. He was on his way to having eight kids, good Catholic um, family, good Catholic church. And one day along the way, JP's sister had problems in her marriage. I mean, I think it was ongoing for several years. She decided she couldn't take it anymore. She left the marriage. She was not in a good state to take care of her kids. And JP's wife in particular stepped up and says, JP, we have to take care of these kids. They brought the four kids in. They weren't so small, but they were whatever age. And over, they thought it would be short term. It ended up being long term. They took care of those kids and their church and church community provided a lot of support to enable them to do that because it was a big burden, especially because they were not so old. The sister was older than they were. Kids were already pretty old for them. And JP along the way thought, well, this is the most important thing that he could do. He decided the single most important thing that I can do is not policy, but do something about marriage in America. And he took years. He worked at the philanthropy roundtable, years of trying to find the right formula. The idea from the beginning was, because he was a guy who knew marketing and he was a religious guy, we got to use the churches. We got to use the latest marketing techniques, including big data. We have to find some combination of that to find the best formula to help people have better marriage outcomes, especially when their children are involved. So he worked over many years, many trial and error, eventually spun off, started Communio. And Communio now has a larger staff. It has a nationwide presence. It's on a way in the next several years to be a whole nationwide organization. And their model, which again is constantly being improved, that's one thing I love about JP, constant iterative learning and incremental improvement. He basically works with churches and they basically use big data to analyze where there's the vulnerable in their neighborhood, people who, uh, w- what is on people's minds, what are the risks of people getting divorced or possibly singles not getting married, especially if they're going to have kids and has this whole idea of his whole model that he's worked at, that he's proven in a couple of places of getting the churches to most churches talk about relationships, but spend very little money, very little resources, and are certainly not very systematic. So he is helping churches 
learn the best techniques, the best tools, the best training, the best classes, invitations, mixture of programming, everything. And they're all learning, learning from each other. And it's a great, he's such a, such a brilliant guy with the idea that only churches and this technology and marketing techniques can really make a difference. It will increase people going to the church. It will increase marriage outcomes. It will lead to more stable and strong families. And there's so much to learn from him, as well as all these social entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you actually say, uh, JP found that, you said, quote, 80% of evangelical churches and 82% of Catholic parishes and 94% of mainline churches report spending 0% of their budgets on marriage ministry, right? And so this is something he's just clearly- It's shocking if you think about that, how much they talk it. They talk about it, but- Of course, talking. But how do you you stay married? Like, I mean, this is, I think, something that's really important is, you know, marriage takes- work, it takes practice, it takes learning. And so, especially when you have the breakdown of community, people don't know how to resolve their problems. They don't know how to like work together. They don't know, they don't have standards. And I think just training people in that, helping people in that is essential. We don't have very much time. So I, I there's 10, 20 things I could talk to you about. You know, I want to say for readers, you just need to read this book. It's a great book. You know, J.P. DeGance is one example. Uh, Chris Lambert, you give the story of his work in Detroit. I actually had the chance to interview at Chris and visit the work he does at the Dumfries. It's called it the, the, the Durfee Innovation, Durfee Innovation Society. Society in Detroit, which is remarkable. And one of the things that that so there's so many things that I that I'm summarizing quickly because I definitely I highly recommend this book to listeners. And you know, as as you know, at the Acton Institute, Seth, we're starting a center for social flourishing, and there's a real overlap. And we've learned a lot from you already in this. It's like one of the things I'll, uh, I thought about uh, from your book and as we're thinking about the Center for Social Flourishing, that the interconnectedness of human family and social flourishing is so important. And so I think of like an after school program. And you talk about one of those at the Durfee Innovation, Innovation Center. I, I met with a lady who does it. It's remarkable. And you think, okay, well, if you if you're working on helping children after school, okay, what else do you need? Okay, well, we can work with families. We can work with entrepreneurs and we can make, there's a connection that Dr. Chris Palmer has done between mental health and metabolic health. So what are people eating? And this broad based vision of human flourishing, um, I think is, it can't be done top down and it can't really be done bottom up. It has to be done sideways. And there's this, I think, overlap. Um, uh, we've been talking about this at the Center for Social Flourishing at Acton, like, okay, how do we think of this broad way of thinking about all of these things together? And I think there's where there was such great overlap with your work on the sideways-based approach. So I have two quick questions for you because of time. Uh, one, I'm, I'm going to make you do something a little bit difficult. The last chapter of your book uh, or the last two chapters, you say rethinking the American dream, and then you have this idea of start here, right? Like we need to have an operational sideways approach, right? Focus on children, especially the boys, because of high return investment. Resources where they can have stretch channel resources where they can have the broadest impact. Target as many drivers of neighborhood health as you can, right? Get early warning systems, engage religious organizations, and work this kind of quarterback sideways. So if you're on an elevator, it's 30 floors, so you have more than three seconds. But can you give just a couple minute summary of this sideways approach that I think is so important for for human and social flourishing? Again, I think it's about relationships. You talked about bonding and bridging. We want every person to live in places where there's this society social support system. That's family, that's interfamily, that's local institutions, churches, schools, associational, but a lot of it's informal, neighbors knowing and supporting neighbors. And so if you think of this as neighborhood by neighborhood, and I, so, I, so first of all, I'm grateful that you have that what you say, and I'm grateful that we have, uh, and I look forward to having some opportunity to work with you. But I think we need to have this vision that every person should have the opportunity. I can't say the right, because obviously we're not going to be perfect, but the opportunity to live in something like a flourishing neighborhood where the, where the families, the interfamily, the streets, the local institutions are there 
and they're overlapping. And when this works right, it just produces spinoff. You mentioned it to some extent. You didn't use the word spinoffs. When a lot of people are this overlapping set of institutions that people are embedded in, it's like embodied relationships embedded in a series of overlapping institutions. That was a bit of a mouthful, but when I that didn't even pay it, you to say embodied embedded because that's a theme of this podcast. So see, you see, it's perfect. I, 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 I almost try to avoid these terms for most Americans. So I'm glad it fits here, but embodied relationships embedded in a series of overlapping, the overlapping part I think is really important because when it's overlapping and it begins to create a web that web, that's where the trust, that organically built trust, that organically built willful interdependence, and then a lot of spinoffs, just naturally, there's some something happens, there's a spinoff, somebody feels a need to start something. You know, we face a series of ongoing challenges, we as individuals, we as families, we as places, and if there's not this type of network and support and trust, and that's producing lots of spinoffs, we're not consistently being ready. I give a practical example. There's been a little bit more worry about safety and security in my neighborhood. So all of a sudden, there's all these spinoffs. During COVID, COVID occurred, and all of a sudden, there was all these initiatives and people putting st- their, their seats in front of chairs in front of their house. So the point is, when you have this and you're yeah. flourishing, you're so much ready to take on whatever comes your way. And when you don't have it, you're not ready and everything is happening to you and you're just, you're, fra- you're, you're fragile and your relationships and neighborhoods are fragile. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, this is again, very super important. And one of the things I've sometimes said is when you also, you have globalized dynamic economy, you know, you talk about the Asian tigers or the Celtic tiger. I mean, a, dy- a dynamic economy is like a tiger. And there's shifts that happen. And so having strong communities helps you navigate these these ups and downs, navigate, say, danger threats, navigate COVID. We need navigate- to be dynamic. We need to be di- – I mean, resilient is a good term, but resilient can also mean that you don't change. Yeah. So dynamic – I mean, uh, some people – Robust use the word, and dynamic. Uh, some people use the word anti-fragile. Yeah, I think out. anti-fragile is what you produce – but that's because the system is robust and dynamic. That's yeah. how I think. I think robust because I think anti fragile like is like is where you you when difficulty like makes you go somewhere else. What we also need is just be robust and dynamic to be able to solve difficult things that that come at you. And I think that's a that's I agree that's better than resilient. And it's more the thing is it's more and more important because yes. this these level shocks or stresses are becoming more frequent and they're becoming harder. And the weaker our social fabric is, the more people are going to fall through it. And I do not think, I think government has a role to play, but it's not going to be to solve all these people falling through the fabric. I like this way we've been talking at the end about robust and dynamic because you have fragile, resilient or robust, and then anti-fragile. But anti-fragile is a different thing. It's a little bit of a different thing. And so, it, and, and I mean, just mean for people who, who know Taleb's work, it's like, well, how do I become anti-fragile? I, I, like we, dynamic, I like dynamic, you know, robust, robust I like dynamic personally. Robust and dynamic is that you're, because it's different. I mean, yes, being anti-fragile is good too, but that's just a different thing. That's, I, I think, robust and dynamic for the community is easier to att- obtain. But anyway, that's a detail. The last question is, um, you have an essay, which I'll put up. And so it's both a big question, but I'm forcing you to do it in short order, uh, Seth, is you have an essay at First Things called The Cure to Our Social Breakdown. It was um, October 23, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes uh, and to other things we've talked about. And here you just mentioned also living in your neighborhood, which is a religious neighborhood. And early on in the in the discussion today, you talked about institutions and relationships. And you say, you know, like politics and economics come from society, society comes from relationships. Um, there's a, a historian named Christopher Dawson, and he makes the argument that cultus, that is culture and specifically religion, is the driving force of culture. That is religion is the driving force. So contrary to say a Marxian analysis would look at economic and social relationships, he says it's the religious ideas, ideals, and practice that is the source of all of these other things. You could comment on that or not, but I do think you, you in your essay at First Things, you do talk about 
how the religious nature of your neighborhood plays a really important role in building the relationships. Could you could you talk about that just a bit? Okay, I think there's four ways in today's world you get strong co- neighborhood communities. One is religious, one is uh, cultural, something that's been there, think of town, many towns in some places. I think you get it because a lot of social institutions, I think you see this in some like Park Slope or Chevy Chase, they're very progressive, but there's a lot of social dynamics, social institutions going there. You could say that's culture, but I differentiate between culture and social. And I think the, the last one is something physical. You're a little bit, I, I know people live in places, they're a little bit removed. That's why I think boundaries, a clear start and a clear end to a neighborhood is very important. Those are four. Mine is, for the most part, religious. Uh, because we are religious Jews, we cannot drive on the Sabbath And therefore, people have to live near each other. And this place started, uh, this area, because some of the synagogues moved out from downtown, started roughly 60 years ago with one one place, then a second place. Now there's roughly six, depends upon how you count, because there's some backyard praying going on, so to speak. But we have six big synagogues or or medium-sized, depends how you define that. And then we have all these institutions around that. It's not so walkable, but it's everything is close enough that it is walkable, whether you have a sidewalk or not. There's some restaurants. So everything goes on within roughly a 30 minute walk. And there's, again, a few thousand, maybe 2000 families, maybe less than 2000 families. If you include the kids, you're getting seven, eight, nine, ten thousand people. And not every religious Jewish community is is for me as warm as this one. It happens to be warm because it's a bit isolated. There's not many other religious Jews in greater Washington. If I'm in New York, I find it a a bit less warm because there's so many people you don't appreciate your specialness. Here we feel the specialness and we're we're like in a container or in a cocoon. And it's just the feelings, again, you have being with each other and knowing each other. I mean, again, it's not friendships. It's hundreds and hundreds of relationships and a feeling uh, for me, joy and social support, whatever I do every day. So I don't know if you want more detail than that, but it, the key thing is the Sabbath. And I think I'll just mention for Christian listeners, I mean, I've I've tried hard in these months to reach out to Christian audiences. I think one of the challenges, my faith, because we've been in the minority for so long. I mean, Israel changes things to some extent, but in the diaspora, we've been in the minority for so long is that we live countercultural. We are comfortable being different than society, especially if you're in the orthodox, more traditional part. For my Christian friends, so used to being the culture, as the culture has evolved, I think Christianity, what it means to be Christian And what the faith means has changed tremendously. Therefore, churches are somewhat consumer oriented. They're less demanding. I think the idea of Christianity has shrunk. It has shrunk from the original meaning. There are attempts to make peace or fit with the culture because Christians are used to being the culture. And I think for Christians to thrive in the world ahead, today in the world ahead, they need to be much more countercultural. And they need to reclaim community as a core element. Uh, The understanding, uh, creed matters, ideas matter, but it's got to be community. And that's why place matters. And to the extent that the church, the Sabbath matters, it's one of the few ways I can think of, of Sabbath and holidays, bringing people together in a thicker way. So it's not just two hours, it's all day. And even if, I mean, for me, all day can mean besides praying and meals, I just sit at home and read for hours. I mean, that, I'm not the most social person, but that there's no phone, there's no technology, there's no cars, there's no cooking, might make a salad or something. And I don't think if Christianity, for it to do well in the future, I think, again, communities, countercultural, it's got to set itself up as a different model than the model that has worked over the last two generations. In my very humble outside opinion. Well, that's a, such a great 
answer. I didn't expect it. I, I, I don't think I could agree with you more. I think that's a super well said. Um, and you touched on some really deep things. I mean, I think I was going to ask you, like, what do we learn from your community? Well, you can learn associationalism, you can learn countercultural, and I think you can, you can learn in a sense, this, to this Dawsonian point, um, I was talking to my children as we were getting ready for the Christmas holidays, right? We were talking about the importance of, okay, the house gets clean, it gets decorated, uh, you dress up nicely. Why? I said, what kind of person lives the exact same way every single day, seven days a week, doing the exact same thing, never dressing differently, never stopping, never pausing? Well, it's a slave, right? And that there's something liberating and free about pausing, having religious liturgy and and worship that I think that's very deep in in human life and then that connects into the things that we've been talking about of uh, human beings have a social nature and so we're 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 unique unrepeatable individuals um, and so to use cr- religious language we're created in the image of God uh, we are endowed with reason and freedom and we have a, we have a social nature and we flourish in community but as individuals we're not radical individuals we have to have communal, relationship and support. And this is how we flourish. And I think um, that's not just um, not just a network. It's a place, it's association, it's it's culture that and, and communities that make moral demands on us and 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 help us live, I think, a flourishing life. So I, I loved your your last answer. I found it inspiring and to me and 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 I'm grateful for it. And um, thank you so very much for taking time. Speaking of the Sabbath, you, you have to get going soon. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really grateful, Seth. So so grateful for you taking time. Really uh, recommend to all the listeners um, uh, the book, Fragile Neighborhoods, and your articles. And then anything else that you'd like to say, like where can people follow you? Any any other recommendations of reading that you suggest to the listeners? Uh, so first of all, you can always find me through my website, sethkaplan.org. If you need to find me, contact. go to the contact page. You can find me on LinkedIn. It's the one and only social media that I'm active on. And you can find me. It's the healthy social media. It's a little bit too much self-promotion on it, but it's it's not so bad. And you can find me on LinkedIn. And I try to post something on community or place um, one or two times a week. And I would be delighted if anyone wants to continue the conversation to find me. And uh, thank you, Michael. And I look forward to more with you and with Acton and Onward. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot, Seth. I appreciate it.